All right, I'm ready to go. So, how's everybody doing today? Yeah? All right, so I'm really excited to be here. This is the first time that I'm presenting at a B-Sides Charm Conference here in what's now my hometown. Um, I was supposed to uh, present many, uh, and during the first one, but I was unable to due to some uh, last minute engagements. But um, I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm very thankful for the organizers and who, who gave me an opportunity to come here and talk to all of you today. So, thank you. Um, are we good, Adrian? Awesome. <sighs> all right, so my name is Jose Fernandez, and I came here to rock. <laughs> I want to rock! <laughs> So the name of my uh, talk is Frony Fronius, um, exploring Zigbee signals from Solar City. Um, I am on Twitter, so if you guys want, guys and gals want to follow me, then please go ahead. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to describe uh, the research goals for for this project. I'm going to illustrate some past works that have been done in the field of, of Zigbee. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the signal analysis that I did and the methodology that I used to do it. The multiple avenues of approach that you can take when you're doing uh, security research into the grand scheme of things. Um, what I call case one, so out of those avenues of approach, I focused on one of them particularly, and that's why I'm able to talk to you, all of you today. And for the research that um, I'm looking to do, and I'm you know, part of this talk is a way for, to, to help me find other people who are interested in doing research because, you know, it's no fun being John Rambo and, you know, just doing everything yourself, right? It's always, you always get better results when you integrate and involve more people and, you know, the opportunities are there, but sometimes, you know, we just don't know where to start. So about me, I am an InfoSec researcher. Um, for the purposes of this talk, um, I consider myself a mad researcher, a mad scientist. I focus mostly on attack and defense, mostly, and I'm a veteran. I'm a PhD student, and this presentation, you know, legal disclaimer, right? It's, it's, my, it's my own, it's my own views, my own research. It doesn't involve any of my employers, past current, right? So, took care of that. So, all of this started a year ago. Um, I had access to Solar City equipment, and I was like, huh, this is pretty interesting. I mean, how does this all work? Like, how does it communicate? I saw that these things had antennas, that there were devices that I, I had to plug in, you know, in, inside a network, and I was like, huh, how does, how does all this work? So I spent countless hours uh, during that year just learning about SDRs, learning about Zigbee, um, reversing, among other things. But I had to wait for the right time in, before doing any of the actual like hands-on research. And my hypothesis was someone like me who had very little experience, exposure, knowledge of Zigbee could go from zero to now in front of all of you <coughs> due, to the la due to the vast amount of work that has been done on Zigbee research over the years. I'd be able to provide meaningful contributions into this field for the purposes of defense. So I pitched an abstract. It's like, hey, you know, I have a pretty good feeling that, you know, if this idea gets picked up, you know, I'll be able to run it and be able to present in a short amount of time. So now I have an actual reason to do all this work, right? So I thought about how to attack this research and what what I was going to do to understand all these technologies and all the things that, that make it work. And that was, uh, you know, long hours, long days, right? Because I'm sure all of us already have nine to five jobs and, you know, maybe more than one, right? So I was able to devote a lot of my free time in the pursuit of this. So my hypothesis was, if a large pool of past works exists in your field, how feasible is it to replicate the findings 
on systems that are unreported, right? So in a lot of these other research, or a lot of the other research that you'll see, it, it may focus on, on certain things, but you know, in this case, um, I wanted to, to see how Solar City actually employed um, their communications. There was no existing public research on either Solar City or Fronius, which is the uh, manufacturer of the power inverter that this company is starting to deploy, that tied Zigbee analysis until today. So I'm adding to that, uh, to that knowledge base right now by just being here and presenting. No Zigbee research done to date, period. <sighs> Secretary Spicer, that's not true. I don't even believe that he said that, but nowadays, maybe he did. <laughs> so, these are, you know, a lot of past works done by other individuals, you know. Um, let's take a moment to give them a round of applause for all of the work that they've done. <laughs> There's so many projects that, you know, it, it's one thing for you to do research and then not tell anybody about it, but when you share it with everybody, um, you, you grow that body of knowledge. But at the same time, you know, you, you put yourself out there, right? So you're going to be subject to critique. But um, a lot of these individuals, and many, many others, right? I, I couldn't just put all of them in a slide, but th there's definitely a, a lot of material out there that if you're interested in this technology, you can just pretty much search for it and run with it. Now, here comes the perfect timing in all this. So the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of all pieces of you know, legislature that are out there, um, now allows InfoSec researchers to conduct research on consumer devices. The research has to actually start in 2017, so that may mean fiscal year for the government, but you know, I literally started around January of 2017 doing the actual hands-on aspects of my research. So I spent about a year thinking about how was, I was going to approach this problem and how to best approach this. I contacted the vendor to start a dispo, uh, responsible disclosure channel and I received approval to present today. So thank you to them. Uh, we came to an agreement and to limit some of the things that I've already uh, shared with them in terms of findings. <laughs> while they, you know, internally figure out how they're going to permanently fix some of these issues. So in, in my case, Solar City or Fronius, they didn't have public, uh, like, contacts. It's like they didn't have a bug bounty. They didn't have any of that. So at first, it was a little bit uh, tough to figure out, you know, how to actually do responsible disclosure because sometimes, you know, if, if you're doing research on a particular vendor, the information isn't out there, and you don't just want to call the you know 800 number and say, hey, you know, I got vulnerabilities to disclose. It's like, you know, let's talk about it because you know it, it opens you up, right? So I used um, some, you know, I watched the news, so I knew that Tesla had pretty much acquired Solar City, and Tesla does have a bug bounty pro program. So I was able to use that POC. I contacted them. It's like, hey. I know you guys aren't Solar City, but since you guys merged, perhaps you know who I could contact. And they actually brokered the communication. So my initial observations was uh, Solar City starting to roll out the Fronius equipment to its solar customers. Um, when it comes to the um, companies like this, where you know it's like smart metering and you know generate your own power, there's there's multiple vendors out there, but um, in this case, Solar City started rolling out some of the Fronius equipment. And you know, the device, um, I would assume, would have to collect that metering information and report it back somehow. So if, if this thing, if there's this power inverter, which I'm going to show later, that is like physically outside of your residence or place of work, it communicates with an internet gateway that is inside your residence or place of work, right? So there is some form of communication from something on the exterior to something inside. 
This particular vendor uses equipment from Fronius and Digi. Who's, who's heard of Digi? Yeah. They have a huge ecosystem of products. And uh, in this case, um, even though I, I did the responsible disclosure through Solar City, you know, they, they use their products. So if you try to approach all three or more at the same time, you know, your mileage may vary in terms of uh, acceptance. So the communications flow between the devices, this is what the power inverter looks like. In this case, uh, that is a Fronius Primo model. As you can see there in the bottom, that little black thing there, that's, um, there's an antenna there. This thing communicates to the internet gateway, which is, you know, a small, small little device, you know, also has an antenna. All right, it looks, it looks kind of innocuous, right? It looks kind of safe. <laughs> That talks to your LAN, which talks to something, right? Because it's not really clear at first, just by looking at these things, how is this actually communicating you know, over the net? So the solar gateway needs three lights to, to function properly, right? One's going to be your power. The other one's going to be the network link on your, on your LAN. The other one's going to be the Zigbee link. So three lights. I'm sorry, John Luke, there's actually three lights. So my initial thoughts on the equipment were, if they, if they gather that consumption device of, of the energy that you produce, you know, what, what else are they collecting? So the company has already, you know, disclosed that, you know, they can actually fingerprint the devices inside your house based on how they draw power. Right? It's pretty interesting. So they can actually tell what model of like large appliance you're using, like a washer dryer, refrigerator, they can actually fingerprint those things based on the consumption of the, that's pretty cool, right? And then, you know, for me, you know, yeah, I guess I'm okay with that right now, because, you know, let's say you had a really old dryer and they're able to fingerprint it and all of a sudden you start getting marketing mailers for like discounts for a new energy efficient one, right? So this is a marketer's dream, but at the same time, what do you, what do all of you consider could be the repercussions of once this technology actually becomes very precise, let's say that there's certain devices out there that they don't want people to own and you power them and they're able to fingerprint that. Where does the, 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 the sharing of that information stop? Right? So there are some concerns there. But you know, for now, hmm. My initial thoughts looking at these things is like, you know, it looks kind of flimsy. So it's like, are, are these things really secure? Right? I keep hearing about IoT, and the IoT for me means the Internet of Threats. And I keep hearing about how all these other, like, vendors and corporations, they keep getting it wrong. So I was a little bit suspicious at first. I would want to remind everybody here that, you know, there's always, when you're doing InfoSec research, there's three things that you need to consider. Uh, you know, this digital millennium copyright kind of like thing that, that came out, that's okay, but you never want to be the first person to have to test that in a court of law. So you always have to consider the difference between what you can, what you can do, what you could do, and what you shouldn't do at all times. If you see a lot of the other presentations that you know happen and let's say like conferences like DEF CON and stuff like that sometimes they'll do the research and and you know it's, they're pretty much violating a lot of the title 18 laws especially the computer fraud and abuse act right and it's, sometimes they get lucky and you know they don't get sued they don't get right they don't get threats sometimes the talks get pulled right because they don't go through those proper channels so always consider things that you could do within the scope of yourself and your own reality, right? Because there's always many more things that you can do and usually some of those can get you in trouble. At the same time, you shouldn't be afraid to explore and just open things up and figure out how they work because that is part of this community, right? If we don't take a screwdriver and a flathead to things and figure out what's actually there, um, we're doing a disservice to our communities. 
So are these things secure? Uh, my initial re response to that answer is yes. I'm going to continue doing this presentation as I continue the, the process of responsible disclosure and hopefully that'll always remain that way. You also have to consider don't give away free pen tests to companies when you're not invited or you know just just don't do all of this work when nobody asked you to and nobody wanted you to do the, the work either right so don't just do all this work and then just give it away to them for free right there's something else to consider never value your time at zero there are multiple avenues of approach to, to kind of understanding how the vendor actually ties all these devices and communications together. So um, there's the communication between the power inverter and the internet gateway. The communication of other power inverters and internet gateways. And by that I mean you know the ones that you may or may not own. The communication between the internet gateway and the company. Uh, the communication of a web app that they have in order for you to communicate with the company and then you can see you know how much power you're producing and, and things of that nature. They have a mobile app. So that's a, diff that's a whole different avenue of approach. How does the mobile app communicate and tie into all this? And you know for me the most interesting one was the communication of the gateway and its internal components. Right? So this presentation is only going to focus on the very first avenue of approach, which is the communication of the power inverter and the internet gateway, because at this time it would just be illegal to, to disclose some of the things that I've discovered, and I'm still you know, working to put all that together also. So um, you, you need to give the, the vendor a time to fix, or you're just doing a disservice and you're opening yourself up for lawsuits and other nasties. So recently, uh, Digicorp actually put out the Internet of Threats security balance between economic cost and benefit. So perhaps the people in the back cannot see this very clearly, but <laughs> so it, it's pretty much the cost to scale ratio between, you know, here's some at the bottom, there's some communication attacks. Yeah, I shouldn't point things. <laughs> um, so in there you have some, some man in the middle attacks that you can do. Um, there's some software attacks that involve apparently malware and social engineering are up in the scale. I would argue that social engineering, you know, costs almost nothing, right? So um, that's just my perspective though. But over on the right side, we have invasive hardware attacks and non-invasive hardware attacks. So in the non-invasive channel uh, aspect of this, they have side channel analysis, uh, JTAG, right? So they know what people can do to their devices and they're aware, but they, they put a, a cost, kind of like risk balance to all this because the, the things at the very top were the um, invasive hardware attacks they figure that those things could be, you know, it could take a lot of time and resources to, to actually produce. So, you know, they know that those things can happen, but, you know, they, they see the likelihood of trying to make pre preventative measures to defeat those things. It's kind of like, you know, right now it's just, you know, when you do cost-benefit analysis, it's not just, it's not worth it at this time. It's a business decision. So you might be asking yourself, why, why are we only talking about the first thing? And why are we talking about the, the first thing? Why, you know, why, how did you get permission to do this? And it's because there's a physical security problem with these devices, right? These things are usually outside of somebody's residence or building. They have to be accessible by, you know, not only the, the power company that it's tied into, but, you know, if there's like a a fire or some other type of emergency, you know, the, those uh, first responders need to potentially come in and have to, you know, turn this equipment off. So there's a physical security pro uh, problem in the way that it gets integrated and deployed to customers. Anyone can access this panel. In fact, you can pretty much operate this thing. 
um, just using the dashboard, and you can get some, some pretty cool, uh, you can do some pretty cool things with it, and you can also do some very damaging things with it. So I, I, know, I notified the vendor of the particular problem, and you know, I, I kind of expressed that you know, this, this is worth talking about because this is already out there, and it's been out there for years, and nobody's really talked about this openly. So you might be asking, why not the second one? Why didn't you try to figure out how the other people's power inverters communicate? Right? So I did a poor man's war drive with the Zigbee module, and I had some, oh, you can barely see it, but um, I, had, I had some e-waste in terms of a laptop that I was throwing away, but I took out the, the wireless antenna, because you know, when you throw the, you know, different electrical components and you know, old hardware out, you can still scrap some things and then you might use them in the future. So I was able to do that, and then I was able to amplify the, the signal strength of my poor little uh, XB device. And you know, I tried, but it was very difficult because um, I found that very few owners around my area actually had the same configuration that I had. Um, from my experience, I was told that, hey, you're one of the first people to start getting this new equipment with this type of particular configuration. Uh, sometimes they do the configuration where it uses wireless, Ethernet, right? Those things are also very interesting and they suffer from this fa the same physical security pro uh, program, uh, problem. So, uh, Solar City has a web app where you can actually find other solar consumers near your area. That's pretty cool. Right, so um, I, I used that web app and I started driving around. It's like, okay, I know where that street is. And then, you know, I just used visual analysis. It's like, you know, just look at the roofs. You'll find the solar panels, right? It's not, you know, you don't have to get too technical with this. And uh, I, I did some, some non-invasive scientific analysis. By that, I mean if a device popped up on my screen, um, I wouldn't have tried to interact with it further. It would be the equivalent of using something like a Wi-Fi stumbler or something like that. Oh, you can't read that. <laughs> so I, I kind of stopped doing these too because uh, for me it just wasn't as interesting as other things. Um, but if you do want to help with this initiative, um, frony fronius at protonmail.com is going to be the, the email that we're going to be using so that way if you are interested in assisting with this research or just getting involved um, that's going to be that or you know talk to me after the talk. Um, ideally I'd like to find somebody else who has the similar solar equipment so that way we can compare notes. Right? And local would be better because I'm pretty sure somebody else besides me has this and they may or may not live close by. So when you look at their web app, so all those, all those pins on Google Map, those are other uh, solar customers that they have. When you click on the details of those pins, the information that it gives you is how much power they've produced. That's pretty cool, right? There's no, they actually took some time to, to make sure that you can't just like grep this and you know, find GPS points and stuff like that. So. They did take their time to kind of reduce the exposure of that customer information, but it's still pretty interesting, right? You can pretty much find people who are solar friendly by using this. So the easiest way to start, like most things that, you know, you, you know, without taking a screwdriver to it, is look at the labels. In this case, I had two devices, so I looked at the label for what was uh, outside. And you can't really see it too clearly there, but there's an FCC ID number there. Right? So then when you do a search for that, it's in 2.450 megahertz, right? Nothing talks like that, right? Yeah, that is an empty, empty frequency. No, it's, it's not. It's unlicensed, so a lot of devices you know, are going to operate in those channels. For me, I was just like, okay, so there's, there's a lot of things going on there. Let's find out what's going on here. So I started speaking to some of my peers. It's like, hey, what's the best way to approach this, right? And I was told, just put a USRP on it. OK. So that looks like this. Oh. 
Right? No, it's not that easy. It's bad advice. So then I was told, just throw a USRP at it. Let's see what that looks like. Nah. I started doing signal analysis, so I, I purchased this uh, very small um, kind of USB dongle from Texas Instruments. It's a CM2531. I think it costs a little bit less than $50, and it's specifically built to, to help analysts and researchers find um, Zigbee communications. I use stationary analysis to identify the communication between the devices. And I determined that, you know, there were going to be other IoT things talking also. So I came up with the hypothesis that, you know, if I remain at a stationary position and just look at the different channels over, over long periods, I'll be able to determine which is my device just by the amount of data it's being transmitted. I did this for 14 days, and by that I mean in the morning I would wake up, I would select the channel, I'd run it, and then when I'd come home in the evening, I would stop it, and I would look at the, look at the uh, information that was collected. So in my case, it was channel 20, the one where my uh, the Zigbee equipment was communicating on. I did the same thing with Killer B. It, uh, it took a minute to ID the, the, the devices and the channels that they were operating on, another three minutes to PCAP on that channel, and it maybe took an hour to flash those uh, Razer USB sticks they have, right? Because just because you get it, you still have to flash it in order to kind of support packet injection and the other cool features. So looking at this, uh, I'm not going to show you guys the PCAPs because it's, it's, too, it's too intense, to be honest. So it was beaconing every three seconds. And I was like, three seconds? You know, yeah, odd number, but it's like, why? Why three? Is this really my stuff? So I, I compared the, the MAC addresses on both labels. I matched both of them. It's like, yeah, it's my stuff. And then the, the packet sniffer from, from Texas Instruments, it's called Packet Sniffer. Uh, it has an awesome GUI and it's great eye candy, but you know, I need PCAP. This thing outputs to a .psd and it's not Photoshop. So I was like, packet sniffer data. It's like, come on guys, that also means something else. So they, they actually have a, a Wireshark converter, so then you can take those PSD files and convert them into, wire, into PCAP, and then you can, you know, do more things with that. There's also these other like third-party drivers where you can output like a, a FIFO file and then open that through Wireshark, but I found this to be the easiest. Considering I'd collected tons and tons and tons of PCAP, it was, it was a good way. So, hmm. So I decided to take a peek at the things that are outside, right? What's in the device? <coughs> Because, you know, there's a physical security pro uh, program, uh, problem with it, so let's open it up, and what information can I pull from it? And I kept thinking, you know, I kept thinking, you know, there's encryption involved and stuff like that, you know, or do I really want to, like, offset and do all this stuff? Let me, let me figure out what's there first. So this is a picture of the center of the, of the PCB board for the power inverter, and you can, the, the, that cap is huge, and there are many caps just like that one. So all of those things want to kill you. So even if you power off these things, you still need to discharge it, and you need to be extremely careful. I mean, I've seen this thing uh, work with 19 amps at any given time. Yeah, you know, it takes l almost less than one to kill you. So <sighs> be careful, right? Don't just go in there and you know, try, to, try to mess things up, or you know, just be very careful when you do it. So this is what the uh, daughter board looks like. So I was able to, so this thing has a daughter board, and yeah, see, I already see heads shaking, right? So, um, so, so can somebody say what, what's wrong with this picture? <coughs> Any takers? So uh, one of the things that I found pretty curious, you know, it's not only the XB stuff, but it's that capacitor, oh my god, too much coffee. So you see that, that cap there? And then it's going through the antenna wire. I was like, oh, maybe this is a trap. Maybe, you know, this is some form of like physical, you know, 
maybe I need to be careful with this, like Indiana Jones, but no. Um, so it turns out that the, that the way it communicates from the outside inside, it's using XP Pro, right? And that chip isn't soldered in. So you can literally just pull it and put it onto that device there on the right, which is an XP Explorer. Let's do some analysis on that. I loaded it into a program called XCTU. Who has not heard of XCTU? Let me tell you, just doing this Zigbee stuff and then learning about XCTU, I was kind of like, this exists? Like whoever, like all the people that developed that, um, they spent a lot of time incorporating features that only like engineers would care for, right? People like us also. So there are so many cool features. And I was very surprised with what I found. So when you load XCTU, you tell it, hey, I want to use this Zigbee device. So the device that I pulled is the one on the right. Oh, sorry, the one on the left. It's, it's working as the router right now. The one on the right is the coordinator. I'm not going to get into Zigbee specific you know, aspects and the communication and all this, but those things are important. So it's able to pick out that other device that's inside a building, right? Cool thing is you can double click on, the, on your device on the left and you can actually reprogram it on the fly. You can read the config and reprogram it. Very cool. It has many, many other features which I will not cover today. But needless to say, barrier to entry is very low. Right? So, so there, you know, I, I kind of mentioned this thing beacons out every three seconds. There's my three seconds, the, the scan duration. So every three seconds, it was scanning. So I was able to answer my own question. So I can read this, all the information's there, great. What else? I was looking for that well-known Zigbee Alliance key. Right, because I figured, hey, this is maybe, maybe, right? Maybe this is through the faults. You would find your answer here. This is part of the things that I've agreed with the vendor not to directly talk about today, but it would be that easy for anyone to open this pull the config, and read um, encryption-specific information that way. It's all there. It is. This was the part that blew my mind. You can actually remote into the coordinator with, with the thing that you just pulled from the outside. So yeah, see? I can already see the looks on your faces like, what? Yeah! And this is what cyber should look like. In my opinion. Because if I just videoed how easy it was, it wouldn't be as cool. So you double click on the coordinator. You're in the coordinator. Just like that. I was really surprised. I was like, I, I was not expecting that to work. But it, it's built into the, the capabilities of the, the, the spec. Actually, it's supposed to be meshy, programmable, right? Um, from my experience in the past, I thought these were only used in like dev kits. I didn't actually expect to find this in something, you know, out in production, but it was. And then you can start um, seeing the, the, the actual way that device is configured to um, communicate um, not only the channels, the pan IDs, and other, other cool stuff, right? So you can pull even more relevant encryption aspects from this remotely. So you took something from the outside, you went in, and you're able to read that config, and you can also configure it too. So you can change it to whatever you want. I thought that was pretty neat. So if, if you want to do kind of like more Zigbee analysis, I would always recommend that you know you get something where you can attach an antenna to it, just so you you know you get better results, you get you can see more things. Now, the cool thing is you can actually use XCTU to just look for other devices, right? So you can program this, you can start mapping out different things, and you can probably remote drill into those things too. Yeah? No? I thought that was cool. No? Yeah? Would you agree? 
Right, so I like getting things that you know you're able to connect antennas just for this very purpose. Because you, you look at things like um, the Razer USB stick. There's no way to connect an antenna to it unless you know you get very creative. And sometimes you don't have to. You can just use commodity hardware that's already out there to do stuff. So in this case, uh, I, I started doing you know poor man's um, signal replay, and that that video there on the left was me replaying traffic, um, just very very crudely. But I'll, I'll be honest, it didn't work because I was a victim of Geigo. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the way I was replaying traffic and what I was actually replaying. So I wanted to keep the three green lights at all time. And you know, within half an hour of just doing these weird replays without you know, manipulating dates or you know, accounting for the different aspects in this, it dropped. right? But there's always the potential that if you spend time doing this, you might get results. So I propose that you know to secure uh, the the problem, this vendor needs to stop using this this pan ID that seems to be used, you know, through through other uh, solar companies. They need to start either changing the pan ID or you know just mixing it up, right? To to not make it as easy to be able to identify these things. Um, if you want, you can actually use XCTU and change your encryption on that coordinator first, on the thing that's inside, right? Because when I looked at this device, it had 31 things that I would have to unsolder, and I didn't want to do that. Because, you know, I can you know, <laughs> barely on a good day solder most things. So 31 things, and then, yeah, I didn't want to do that. So you can actually set encryption however you want, remotely, then you can do it on that power inverter. That thing that you extracted from the exterior, then you set it that way. You know, you've, you've done that. It has limitations because anybody can still pull these things, and they can pull your config. So maybe, you know, the vendors can get creative, and they can do things to either deprogram this, this small module or load it from another data source. I mean, there's different things that they could do, but, you know, is it feasible? I can't really answer that. You know, definitely, I would say at least solder the damn thing in. Make it hard, right? <laughs> so some of the future work, I, I looked at a lot of the passive communication as to how this thing talks out to the mothership, how does it report, you know, the metering and all that stuff. And I was able to, to kind of find similarities as to the endpoints where it was actually talking out to. So just take some time and consider the things that are on the right side. Um, you know, it's, there, there was no clear text, default passwords, none of that stuff. They addressed all of that, right? So, still interesting, you know, communicates over the net. Hmm. I spent most of my time doing uh, research on the actual device itself. So, looking at things that I could pull from memory. That's what these are, you know, kind of like proofs of work that I was able to pull that I felt were relevant to show. These are the kind of things that you can extract from, from memory, and there's always, you know, better ways to do things, also, right? So I use very rudimentary uh, process to be able to do this, but, you know, that I can figure out, you know, what version of at least Python that they're using with this. Um, you can see some, some of the companies and softwares that they incorporate into this. Um, you can actually see like C code and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done. That's why I'm I'm here today. I'm looking for other people who kind of want to assist with this, help take it further. Right? Call for allies. You know, let's work to solve cool problems together, and you know, let's be ethical about it too, right? Because nobody wants to go to jail. Um, I'm not really looking to get into like any bug bunny programs because they'll usually tie you into an NDA and then they'll limit what you can and can't say. That's mm. frowny fronius at protonmail.com. Any questions? Yes. That's what that, um, earlier I kind of asked if somebody has this, I'd like to be able to talk to them so that way we can share and compare notes. 
Um, you know, just looking at the roofs is one thing, but then when you're looking at the side of people's buildings and they're out in the street and they're like, hey, what, what's this character doing? Yeah, it's like, ah, it's okay, I'm an infosec. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't trigger any alarms. But. <laughs> So, and that's an interesting point, because when, when you see all the man in the middle things, usually they, they want you to install things on the client device first, but this is a small embedded thing. You can't really trick it into, it's like, hey, no, use this from now on. So you have to get a little bit more creative if you want to do those things. It's definitely still an avenue of approach, though. Any other questions, comments? Well, that's it. Thank you so much for being here, and um, you know, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, right now.